So the Bible teaches that as Christians, we are what we call dual citizens, dual citizens, that we have our primary citizenship and allegiance to the kingdom of God. That is primary citizenship, citizens of the kingdom of heaven. And our secondary citizenship and allegiance is to whatever temporary secular governing system we find ourselves under. Okay, so that's, the Bible lays that out, especially through the New Testament, as you have Jews and Gentiles coming together in this new community, new family, lays that out pretty clearly. You are, in this sense, dual citizens. Your first primary citizenship is to the kingdom of God. Your second temporary citizenship is to whatever temporary governing system we find ourselves under. So Christians are all in this sense, and this might sound strange to some of you, maybe not to others, we are all in this sense foreigners with a temporary citizenship even in the lands of our birth. So a couple of you this morning are here not in the land of your birth. Um, many of you are in the land of your birth. You're, very, you're like, oh, this is, this, is my home. this is my homeland. But what the Bible says is that really it's not that you are temporary citizens and foreigners even within the land of your birth because your home country is with God. Get it? Are we, can we nod here? So your home country is with God. Um, this is, it's really fascinating. This is what Hebrews tells us, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 13, that even the Old Testament patriarchs recognized. Many of them, again, leading into this formation of God's people of Israel, they still understood this. It says they admitted that there were aliens and strangers on the earth. Aliens or foreigners and strangers on the earth. Right? They knew their home country was with God. So then Peter echoes this. He, he says that he talks about, in one of his letters, his first letter, that he, he, he talks about the church, right? This, this new ecclesia, this new called out people of God, all tribes, all nations, all tongues, God calling a people to himself in Christ. That this, this new Jesus community is God's new people, new priesthood, new nation. And then he refers to us, Right For those of you who have accepted Christ, he refers to us as aliens and strangers in the world. He's like, you're not home. You're not home. This is just like, this is secondary citizenship. This is temporary citizenship. You're a foreigner here. So our question in Romans has become, how should the gospel... King Jesus, who saves those who come to him in faith from the dominion of sin and death unto the life-giving dominion of his lordship, his authority, his kingship, through his death and resurrection, how should that gospel practically work out in our lives? That's the question that Paul is leaning into in this latter third of his letter to the Roman church. He, having dealt with how our transformed lives right? New status, new family, new humanity. If you're just visiting, you're like, I don't know what you're talking about. We could have a cup of coffee later, right? New status, new family, new humanity. How that should relate to ourselves, how that should relate to how we deal with the Christian community, how that should relate even to how we deal with our enemies, with our lives offered in worship, in view, right? Always with the backdrop in view of God's mercy, always in sincere love, Paul now takes this moment to focus on how Jesus' followers, who are aliens and strangers, right, foreigners in this world, how we should relate to human governing authorities. Okay, let's hear it, Paul. So, first seven verses, we're just going to read right through of Romans chapter 13. I'm reading out of the New International Version. Everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Tell us what you really mean. He's actually going to say this a few times. So consequently, he who rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment 
on themselves. So let me just stop right there. Like, if, what do we think might be stirring if he says something like that? What might be stirring in this context? Hmm? Yeah. Okay, rebellion. Very good. <laughs> so there's, he's, he's writing to a specific group of people in a specific time, okay? So he says, he who rebels against authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from the fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right, and he will commend you. For he is God's servant to do you good, but if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword for nothing. So again, just a little pause there. It's really interesting. He's talking about the state or the government bearing the sword, being able to inflict punishment. That's a very interesting contrast to what he talked about as the individual responsibility for Christians just a few verses ago, right? Don't seek vengeance. Seek peace. You know, that, that you, are not to, you are not to aggressively seek revenge to make things right on your own. But here he says, the state has a responsibility to make things right, to bring justice. <clears throat> he is God's servant, an agent of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also because of conscience, right? We know that this has been God's order. This is also why you pay taxes, for the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing. Give everyone what you owe him. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. Really fascinating verses. So, with, within an increasingly hostile environment, and this was an increasingly hostile environment, Paul doesn't instruct this Jesus community, which apparently, at least with some of them, there were these rumblings of maybe rebellion, of pushback against these, these human rulers. He doesn't instruct them to violently resist. That would go against everything we know of Jesus, our king, right? That would go against Jesus' teaching, Jesus' example. He doesn't at this time tell them to flee, Although there are times for that, um, even late at later points, as Rome becomes even more aggressive against the church, there were times that proved necessary to flee for those who could. Even Paul at times uh, fled persecution. But instead, at this point, Paul applies what we, uh, what we see in chapter 12, verse 18. As far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Right? And he applies this within the context of relating to these human rulers. That we would, we would, as Jesus followers, engage with civility and cooperation. Civility and cooperation. Now, there have been governments in human history that, that where the, the church has run the state. There's been, there's been setups like this, okay? The church has run the state. And there have been governments in human history in, where, uh, in which the state has run the church. And we can do a, a history lesson later if anybody wants to. These, these setups have never gone well. They've never gone well. Because here's the problem. Humanity is corrupt. Okay, and, and in our corruption, there's always this desire, this sinful desire for power, and typically money is tied into that. So these, these setups where the church has run the state or the state has run the church have never gone well because of the corruption of mankind. One day, Christians look forward to a true theocracy where King Jesus will return and bring all hum human dominion finally under his feet. That kingdom is being established now. How is it being established? It's being established as one person at a time bows their knees to King Jesus and says, you are Savior, you are Lord. So even within my temporary citizenship of this, whatever human construct of government I'm under, I recognize that you're the true king. That's how this kingdom is being established one person at a time right now. It's been being established for the last 2,000 years. 
But one day it will come in its final, complete, and perfect form upon the return of Jesus Christ. Amen? But until then, we live in this tension. We live in this tension of dual citizenship, of truly being a dual citizen on this earth. But during this age, it seems that, the, that the, what, what Paul is saying, both the state and the church have responsibilities before God. It seems that, and I'll, I'll coin it this way, the imperfect ideal is one in which the state and the church can both cooperate and honor one another's God-given obligations. But I would suggest to you that within this broken world, we should never have this expectation that there'll be a perfect marriage between the two. That should not be our expectation. Because one system is of the temporary and is tied into the uh, broken humanity's flawed efforts to self-govern. And broken humanity have, in their essence, rebelled against God. So one system is tied into that brokenness and rebellion. And, and the other is tied into an allegiance to King Jesus and the eternal kingdom of God. They're two different kingdoms. But Jesus' followers are living in both realities until Jesus returns. And Paul's telling us we have certain obligations to both. Jesus kind of pinpoints this tension when someone comes up to him within a Jewish context and, you know, they have an oppressor. The Jews have an oppressor. Rome is the one that is, that is governing their land. And, and here they see themselves as the people of God and they're like, should we pay taxes to Caesar? Should we pay taxes to this pagan government? And remember, like, Caesar would have been recognized as if he was deity. Rome itself would have been recognized as if, they're de if he was de uh, it was deity. It, it was deified, like it was a god. Should we pay taxes to Caesar? What does Jesus say? Yeah, he says, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, right? He asked for a coin. Whose image is on the coin? Caesar's, right? So he says, give to Caesar's what is Caesar's, give to God's what is God's. Hmm. Give to Caesar that which bears his image, right? If I had, I don't have my wallet on me, right? We could break out any, but give to Caesar that which bears his image and belongs to this temporary system of this world. But give to God what? What bears his image, and is a part of the eternal kingdom of God. But there's a lot of friction here. There was a lot of friction for the Christians in Rome. The, the, the very foundation of the reality that they were going around saying, Jesus is what? Lord. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is king. Jesus is authority. He's authority of, over all authorities. So there's this friction that they're following Jesus as Lord, and that seems to fly in the face of this Roman principle that Caesar is Lord. And remember this, not too long before, Jesus hung on a Roman cross, okay? A Roman a Roman execution uh, cross, and his his accusation above him what he was being crucified for was what king of the jews okay so these people are saying we follow this jesus this king that that was his crime <laughs> okay as he hung on a roman cross but we you know they're professing he's he was walking around he was resurrected he ascended to the father and he's he's sitting at the right hand of the father and he's ruler over all things and yeah i'm a citizen here but really i'm a citizen there so do you understand, like, there would be a little tension here. Not only this, there are some in the Greco-Roman cultures where Paul would come around and start preaching this Jesus and Jesus is Lord. And I know he was this poor guy from Nazareth, but really he was the son of God. And he lived this perfect life. He taught us all these things, this way of God. He ended up being executed, but that was purposeful because he needed to die for our sins. And then he rose from the dead and so Paul's going around preaching this, and as people start following Jesus, it starts to bite into some of the trades and practices that were aligned with pagan, pagan practices and worship. 
oh, wait a minute, they're not buying our little idols anymore because they're following Jesus. They're not, they're not buying, you know, you know, they're not buying these sacrifices anymore because they're following Jesus. So this became a problem and people started saying, ah, troublemakers, troublemakers against Rome. Okay? Not only this, we remember that Jews, I've, I've commented on this, the Jews were ousted from Rome at least two times in the last 30 years. Right around when Paul's writing this letter. So they have this, this offense, this frustration. So it's like, how are Christians to live in this tension, this potential conflict? What does this teach us today? And Paul's like, yeah, submit to your authorities. <laughs> Wait, what? This text has often been, let me say this, often been misused and often been abused. So again, as we look at this subject, we have to remember always to read the text within the context, right? What was going on at the time? And also to remember, this is not the only thing that the Bible says about living under human authority, is it? There's a larger context. But with that in mind, we'll consider this scripture with three general principles. And hopefully while we do this, we're humbly admitting that this is a complex and nuanced subject. So here's general principle. I'm specifically saying that. General principle number one, it's simply this. We are to respect human authorities. As followers of Jesus, we're to respect human authorities. Like you can't get around it. <laughs> you know, the instruction of the apostles say this over and over and over again. Paul's making it very clear that as Jesus followers, it is not to be our MO that we undermine human authority, but rather we are to consistently treat it with honor and cooperation. Honor and cooperation. And this is a good general principle for the Jesus follower across the board. Whether it's towards government, whether it's called toward law enforcement, whether it's toward, uh, uh, in my situation in work, my situation in school, my situation in my family. Like, Jesus followers should, by and large, respect and honor and cooperate with human authority. Rather than, rather than this sinful t instinct toward rebellion, toward kind of bucking the system, um, that needs to be quelled. So in this sense, children should honor their parents. Children should honor their teachers. When, employees, if you're employed, okay, I know some of you squirm here. You should honor those who are above you at work. You should respect them. You should cooperate with them. Citizens should honor, like I said, law, law enforcement, governing authorities, and so on. Though all these human authorities are flawed, Paul seems to be recognizing that at least in one, at, to one level, some governing structure is typically better than no structure at all, right? So we can say, like, like that's what's happening in Haiti right now. There's, there's no structure. So it just leads to utter lawlessness, right? And that breaks my heart. So Paul's saying like some structure is typically better than no structure at all. And again, Paul is clearly concerned within this context for the welfare of those he's writing and, and, and for the spread of the gospel, that it would not be hindered. So he encourages them to live uprightly within these governing structures rather than bringing needless harm on themselves or... Uh, harming the gospel's reputation. So the next principle is maybe where the waters get slightly muddy for some. General principle number two. So we were, number one was really easy. We're to respect human authorities. General principle number two. We are to see human authorities as a reflection of a God-established order. We are to see human authorities as a reflection of a God-established order. And this seems to be the primary reason in this section that Paul gives as to why it's important for Christians to honor human rulers. And it's that the governing, their governing authorities, right? This, this governing state is actually a divine construct, not a human construct. Now there's, we've done things with it we've perverted it we've done you know what i mean like we can get into a whole nother conversation there but the idea that there should be order and rule and and that there would be authorities and and this established authority civil system that's a divine construct it flows from the plan and the will of god 
so that there would be societal order and that ideally, as God brings order out of chaos, life can prosper out of that order. Now, does this mean that God specifically has chosen every leader, even the most heinous, to govern humans? And does this justify every human leader's actions? I would suggest to you <laughs> that the original audience would have been like, uh, obviously not, okay? Th th these folks were painfully aware that God had entrusted humans with authority under his greater authority, but that humans regularly abuse that authority for their own selfish purposes. So this instruction doesn't give a stamp of approval on every government and every leader. And that's, way, that's one way that I think this has been horribly abused. Because some totalitarian governments and, and dictators have stood up and said, Hey, haven't you read Romans 13? I'm God's established leader. You have to live under me. You have to obey me. Okay, so even these people knew like, that the Caesars were not like good guys, okay? <laughs> they knew what they were living under, painfully aware of this, and that they regularly abuse their power. It doesn't give a stamp of approval for every leader, every government. Look at his, uh, Israel's own history, and you would understand this. But what we do know is that God's sovereignty is so perfect. God's sovereignty is so big and so beyond all the corruption of this earth that he's able to use even the most corrupt leaders in his larger plan of redemption. Does that mean there wasn't great pain? There wasn't great abuses? No. Go right back to Romans chapter 9. He's talking about Pharaoh. Pharaoh who was throwing babies into the Nile, okay? But God still used Pharaoh in his greater plan of redemption. Look at Nebuchadnezzar. Look at Cyrus, right? We can go right down the line with all these examples. God in his sovereignty is able to use even the most corrupt leaders and nations in his larger plan. But that doesn't mean God endorses them. All right? That does not mean God endorses them. Just like he doesn't endorse your favorite, favorite political candidate. All right? He's not a Republican. He's not a Democrat. He's not whatever you, you know, you line, right? He doesn't endorse them. He is in his greater, beautiful, perfect sovereignty. He'll use them. He's got the long game going, right? But he's not endorsing them. He doesn't endorse their evil and their abuse of power, but he is the king of all. Like that's, that's the idea. That's the picture of scripture. He is the one from whom all authority flows because he is the one that has control over all things. And he will eventually redeem we sang about this this morning. He will redeem even the evil intentions of the corrupt for his good. But apparently we are to see in real time, real space, human ruling authorities as the general application of God who brings order out of chaos of God having established societal rule among humanity. So Paul's like, you know, to, to rebel, to needlessly rebel, is to rebel against what God has instituted, because it's a, it's a divine construct. This is why Jesus could stand before Pilate, right? So Jesus is, is the son of God, king of king, Lord, Lord of lords, and he could stand before Pilate and say to Pilate, you have no power or you have no authority. You would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Does this mean that God purposely handpicked Pilate, that God approved of everything Pilate did? That's ridiculous. John Stott says, Paul cannot be taken to mean that all the Caligulas, Herods, Neros, Dominicans of the New Testament times, and all the Hitlers, Stalins, Ammons, and Saddams of our times were personally appointed by God, that God is responsible for their behavior, or that their authority is in no circumstances to be resisted. Paul means rather that all human authority is derived from God's authority. F.F. Bruce says God is the fount of all authority and those who exercise authority on earth do so by delegation from him and he will also be the one to hold them accountable. 
So, is there ever a time to disobey authority as a Christian? Civil, work, family? Is there ever a time to disobey authority? Okay. Am I making you uncomfortable? Maybe that's good. I don't know. Maybe it's good to make you uncomfortable. We should get uncomfortable. These are hard things. And Paul's writing again to a very specific context, and the Bible is a bigger context, and we've got to take it all in context, right? So part of Paul's argument is that, generally speaking, authorities hold no threat for those who do right. What does that assume? What does that assume? What's that? Yeah, that the authority is doing right, right? <laughs> okay. So the assumption is that human authorities are not grossly abusing their power. And to abuse the power would be to award the evildoer and bring harm to the doer of good. So we could say here that Paul is painting a picture of God's ideal for human authority. Okay? He's painting a picture of God's ideal for human authority. So when that power is severely abused that are in ways that are clearly contrary to God's ideal, at the most basic level, uh, that, that ideal is doing good to those who do good, bringing accountability to those who do harm or break the law, then there is a ground, I would, I would say, with loving and humble discernment to critically question and even at times to disobey those authorities. Everett Harrison says, subjection to the state is not to be confused with unthinking, blind, docile conformity. But we should note here, and this is really important, this is where it takes a lot of discernment because it's hard, right? The Spirit of God should be, right? To, we have to view ourselves with, in, with sober judgment, with clarity, and that's hard to do. That's a Spirit of God work. It, we have to note that it's, it, we have to be able to distinguish between a, general con, a, a, a genuine conflict between obeying God or obeying men versus this own, my own sinful nature recoiling from authority because of pride, uh, because of envy, because of a personal disagreement or a, a disagree, you know, I have a different opinion or a different way, right? So we have to, there's a lot of discernment there. But if submitting to the state or any other authority, okay, if submitting to the state or any other authority truly means that we directly disobey God, it is God we must, that we must obey. Amen? So here's this tension that the Bible presents for us. Submit to the authorities, cooperate with them, be honorable, be upright, live for the good for them. But when there becomes this, this crossroads, and, and you are clearly asked as a follower of Jesus to disobey God, you have a higher authority, your primary citizenship, your primary allegiance. So what, what are a couple biblical examples of this? Quick, what, what do you think of? There's, what, are, what are some biblical examples of this? Yeah, so really great story, right? Exodus chapter one, I think it is. So Herod goes up to the mid, a couple of midwives, Hebrew midwives, and he's like, I'll tell you what, ladies, girls can live, boys die. And you can say, okay, you're Pharaoh, right? But do they do it? No, they do not kill the baby boy. So Pharaoh comes back and he's like, what's the deal? Why are you letting the boys live? And what they say, it's almost funny. They're like, those Hebrew women, they're so vigorous in childbirth. Plop, they, they, just, they pop out those babies before we can even get there. Look it up, right? I think it's chapter one, verse 17. They're so vigorous in childbirth. We don't, we get there. Well, pff, baby's already born. Sorry, Pharaoh, don't don't really know what to do. <laughs> what else? Sure, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, this huge statue, right? Bow to this statue, and they're like, and they are people that are working for the government, right? They're, in, they're captive in Babylon, working for the government. They're like, no can do. Well, if you don't, we're going to throw you in the fire. We sang, again, we sang about this this morning. Well, I'm going to throw you in the fire. All right, you can throw us in the fire. God's going to rescue us. But even if he doesn't, it's okay. You know, we're going to follow him. And then you get that beautiful rescue, and you see this, this one like a son of man, right, that's like this, 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 this mysterious divine one in there with him. What else? 
Daniel, yep, you shouldn't pray. He keeps praying. You, you have the apostles. The apostles are told not to, to stop talking about this Jesus and stop speaking in his authority. And what is, uh, Peter himself says in Acts chapter, uh, Acts chapter 5, verse 29, he says, we must obey God rather than men. So like, you can't keep speaking about this Jesus. You can't keep speaking his name. And they're like, oh, we have to. But as the late Charles Coulson thoughtfully points out, and I thought this was really good, in each case like this, their disobedience was to demonstrate their submissiveness to God, not their defiance of government. Wow. I thought that was really powerful. In each case, they were demonstrating their submissiveness to God, not their defiance of government. And then they were willing to reap the consequences as they still submitted under that government structure. Everett Harrison again points out that submission means that even in his Christian convictions, if his Christian convictions do not permit his compliance, he will accept the consequences of his refusal. So in a sense, even Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego, they, were still, they weren't obeying, but they were submitting. Hey, I'll submit to the consequences, but I can't do this. I can't bow to this idol. I only worship one God. Remember, the very guy who's writing this, at the end of his life, loses his head, gets executed by Rome. He, was, he had been arrested formally at least three times. He had been taken into custody no less than six times because he was seen as this one that was a threat to the status quo of society. But each time Paul becomes before these authorities, he's incredibly respectful. He's incredibly honoring to those authorities. But at the same time, he's like, hey, guess what, guys? Really, I'm following a Jesus that you're going to be accountable to someday, that you're actually accountable to now. So really, your best bet is to actually submit to him. It's fascinating. But again, even within this broken world, we're working, when working within God's basic ideal, governing officials, knowingly or unknowingly, Paul says, are God's servants until the second coming of Jesus, that they, that they should be rewarding those who do good, restraining and bringing appropriate accountability to lawbreakers. They're meant to be earthly agents of God's justice. A justice that's supposed to be working toward right relationships, a peaceable society, the best welfare of the people, serving and protecting its citizens. Really quick, general principle number three, we're to willingly give what is owed to human authorities. Paul wraps up this section with this kind of debt-to-debtor relationship. And he's like, he's like, there are those who, in this civil sense, that are working for the government that we're indebted to, truly, in an earthly sense. We're indebted to their service. That though they do it imperfectly, that they are the extension of God establishing civil authority and keeping order. And they're supposed to be working for our good. So as dual citizens, we always remember that our primary citizenship is in the kingdom of heaven, that Jesus is king, Jesus is Lord, but we're to respect those who serve in, these, in this temporary construct, the temporary kingdoms of this world, while taking every opportunity we can, just like Paul did, to say, hey, guess what? There's actually a, a real king. There's actually a real Lord. There's actually a, an eternal kingdom whose ultimate ethic is love. So contribute your good to the good of the state, both as an institution and the specific people who are employed by it. But in doing so, remember where your final allegiance lies. And wherever the two should truly conflict, you're to obey the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I'm gonna, I'm gonna wrap up with a, a couple of, just a few verses that pertain, just a little collage of verses and then we'll, we'll sing our last song. This is what Peter says to a people that were under persecution. He says, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful trial you're suffering, as though some strange thing were happening to you. But rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed. For the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. 
If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or thief or any other kind of criminal or even as a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. Paul says to Timothy, I urge then, first of all, that requests, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for everyone, for kings and all those in authority. Listen, they weren't electing these people, okay? And some of these people were horrible people. He says, pray for them that we may live peaceful lives, peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Jesus Christ, who gave himself as a ransom for all men. And then finally, Famous verses, but again, reading them in context, this was written to people that were in exile, people that were in exile in a foreign land. In Jeremiah chapter 29, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says, to all those I've carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, build homes, settle down, plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. Also, seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Okay? Pray to the Lord for it because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Yes, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says. Do not let the prophets and uh, diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have, for they are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my gracious promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. Then you will call on me, upon me, and come and pray to me, and I'll listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord. And I will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I banished you, declares the Lord. I will bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. And listen, I think the Old Testament prophets, right? It's layered. It was for them. It was for a future. It was for her. I think it even speaks to us, right? Because in the end, every human authority... For those of us who follow Jesus, every human authority should make us long for the king. Every human construct and every broken and flawed government should make us long for the kingdom of God. Amen? So live thoughtfully, live honorably within this temporary place. But remember that the day is coming that every human kingdom that ultimately represents Babylon, every human kingdom will be brought under the good reign of our Lord, the King of kings, Lord of lords, Jesus Christ. Amen? And we will be with him, our true home, forever. I'll invite the worship team up. Father God, I I pray... These are hard things for us to navigate through. You, you, you know that. There have been a lot of things teased out, some that make us uncomfortable, appropriately so. So give us humility as we enter in. Give us wisdom. Give us, give us the long view, Lord God, the bigger picture as we deal with human authorities and human governments. Help us, Lord God, to to display a humble honor, a humble cooperation, a prayer for the prosperity of these temporary places. Ultimately, that you would be glorified, that you would be honored, that your, your gospel would be advanced. And also, we do pray, give us wisdom and give us strength when we must respectfully disobey those very authorities when they directly conflict with following Jesus as Lord. 
So give us wisdom, give us humility, and give us courage as we need it. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen.